Welcome back everyone to more coverage of SRX The Game. And in today's video, we're talking setups for two tracks in the SRX series itself. We'll be talking about Stafford Speedway as well as the Nashville Fairgrounds. And the reason I'm putting these two tracks together is because they were the first two that I really wanted to work on uh, setups for and the setups ended up being very similar. So what we're gonna do in today's video is I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about the cars themselves and some of the behaviors that I noticed uh, within the physics and the handling. And then we're gonna to go to the individual tracks where I'll talk a little bit about the tracks, lap times, that sort of things. And, and then we're finally gonna get into the setup discussion. And that's really where uh, I wanna spend the bulk of the time because this, type of video is really not about me giving you some perfect or magical setup. Uh, in fact, there's nothing particularly special about my setups. They're simply setups that work very well for me. What I'm most interested in doing is showing you part by part in the setup what each part does and how you can adjust it to make the car handle based on your driver preferences, your driving style overall, because it might be quite different from mine. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we get into the individual setups and the, the track discussion, I want to give you a few thoughts that I've got over uh, this SRX cars to this point in the game. My thoughts about the physics, the handling overall of the cars. And I've got a couple of good things and then one very prominent bad thing. And so let's start with the good. The best thing that I can say about these cars is that the changes I've made in the garage have showed up on the track as I would expect. Meaning that if I make a change in the garage that should tighten up the car on entry, then when I go out on the track to test it, it's tightening the car up on entry as I would expect. So the car is reacting to my setup changes and that is a great thing. And the reason why that is so pivotal is because a game like this that's trying to straddle the line Okay, and what I mean by that is, on one hand, they want to attract the hardcore sim racers that are looking for the best handling. They're looking for the simulation style handling. And on the other side, they're also, they want to appeal to the widest possible audience. And that includes people who play racing games very casually or maybe have never played at all. And this is their introduction into the sport. It can be very hard to appeal to both audiences and walk that line uh, in order to try to appease the more hardcore crowd, which admittedly I'm a part of, and then also appeal to the more casual crowd or the brand new folks to the sport. A lot of times when, you, when a developer tries to do that, the handling characteristics sort of get a little bit muddy and the changes you make in the garage area don't make the change to the handling that you might expect whenever you get on track. So I applaud them. The changes that I've made in the garage area have shown up on the track. So for that, huge applause to them. Uh, and I am very happy to be able to say that. Now, the one negative that I want to say right now is something that unfortunately has almost ruined the experience in the SRX cars for me. Again, I'm, I'm on the hardcore side. I love uh, the handling, I wanted to drive a big, heavy stock car that has a lot of horsepower so that I wanted to try to manhandle the car and figure out how to work within its limitations. And unfortunately, I haven't had to do that because the huge negative is that these cars have way too much grip in the tires. I mean, no brakes are necessary on corner entry. The lap times, for me, I, I started out testing at Nashville Fairgrounds because that's my home track. While I never got to race at that track, I've been going there since I was a small child and I've seen hundreds of races there. And I know about what the lap times should be for a car like this. Now, I haven't seen any testing times, no lap times from any of the different tests they've done with this car. And this series doesn't go to Nashville Fairgrounds until about a little over a month after, as of the recording of this video. So I have nothing, to, no concrete data to go by but in all my times of going to Nashville Fairgrounds, I know that the lap times will be nowhere near what they are in the sim and that the lap times should fall off on tire wear and grip uh, by quite a bit because that track absolutely chews up tires on the long run. So to give you an idea of how much more grip I'm thinking, it's in the line of two to three seconds per lap. I mean, the corner speeds are 
unbelievably fast in the game. And on one hand, I definitely understand why they're doing that. Again, that's the accessibility, trying to appeal, make the, the cars easier to drive for the widest audience. But on the other hand, I'm more of a hardcore guy and I wanted to try to manhandle the car, but in essence, I'm driving this car more like an indie car than a stock car, and that is certainly not something that I was looking forward to. So nothing inherently wrong with driving the car, it's just the appeal appears to be a different segment of the racing community than I am a part of. So with that in mind, let's now head to the individual tracks. Let's get started with Stafford Speedway. And at Stafford, uh, a couple of things I want to pass along to you guys, but first let's talk about the practice speeds. Now you notice the goal time of 15.58. That is max difficulty uh, level 105 against the AI, and I cannot touch that. I'm a couple of tenths off of that at Stafford. Uh, my quicker times are in the 15.8 range, 15.8, 85, something like that uh, for my quicker laps. And again, that's when I'm alone on the track or not fighting with anybody for position. So that's where I'm at, and I'm certainly not pretending to be the fastest guy around, but you need to know that in order to have some uh, idea of where I'm coming from, especially when we start to talk about different setup adjustments. A couple of things I wanted to pass along with regards to driving this particular track. One, I've already talked about it in, in that there is a ton of grip in these cars, and you can drive the car very deep, extremely deep into the corners. However, I have found that my best lap times uh, and the best consistency that I'm able to achieve, which is the most important thing for me, comes in backing off of that entry. So really backing up the entry a uh, half a car length or maybe even a full car length before you actually have to get out of the throttle. So ease the, ease the car into the corner. That will allow the car to settle and then rotate so that you can get back to the gas very aggressively in the center of the corner and on exit. In fact, a lot of times you'll be getting back to the gas before the center of the corner. That's how much grip these cars have. But I, again, I've found that the best way to attack these corners is to go easy into the corner and then come out very explosively because you can get on the gas hard and stay in the gas hard throughout the remainder of the corner. And then of course, that's going to make the straightaways as long as they possibly can be, which ultimately leads to the best lap time. The second thing that I will tell you is get down to the bottom of the track in the corners. Uh, you do not want to get on the apron, so use that white line around the bottom as your guide. You can go just a bit below that and still be fine, but if you get down on the apron, it can cause you a lot of trouble, particularly if you're really loose. Uh, it can cause you to spin out almost instantly. So don't mess around too much with that apron, but make sure you get to the bottom for the best possible lap times. As we get into the setup discussion itself, keep in mind, my goal here is not to give you some magical, perfect setup. It's to give you a starting point. And then as we walk through each part of the setup, give you some options on how to adjust the car to better fit your driving style and thus give you the absolute best enjoyment and most enjoyment out of this game as is possible. That's the ultimate goal. So as we get started with the left front, keep in mind that everything that we're doing in the setup is about balance. We're not just trying to get the car to be as loose as possible or as tight as possible. We want to find balance. And that's what this setup represents for me. It's a balanced race car that is nice and stable that I can run lap after lap, even in traffic, and still feel good about being able to put the car where I want it on the track. Beginning with the left front, camera angle at 3.0 degrees. A wide variety of options to use here. I can I tried using a lot more camber and I also tried using less camber. It all worked just fine, but it does change the feel and the handling of the car. More camber angle is generally for the left front going to help the car to turn a little bit better on corner entry. So it's going to make the car a little bit looser on corner entry. Now in this case, I didn't find that the change was a huge change as far as giving you more grip or less grip in the corner. But there is a change to the way the car feels. Getting too much camber uh, can actually introduce some instability in the car. Um, and the car wants to dart around a little bit more. It doesn't want to grip the track exactly the way I prefer. So overall, you're going to see that on both the left front and right front, I'm using less camber than is certainly possible 
to use. So definitely play around with these numbers and see what works best for you. Spring rate, not just on the left front, but on all four corners of the car, I prefer a stiffer platform of the car, meaning that when I go into the corners, I don't want to feel the car roll over as much uh, because that really disrupts the handling that I'm looking for out of the car. I prefer quicker transitions uh, from the overall platform of the car, so stiffer springs give me what I'm looking for. However, if you're looking for a little bit more roll out of the car when it goes into the corner that, that where you can feel the weight shift over from the left side to the right side and more specifically shift over onto the right front a lot of times, then use softer springs both in the front and the rear. But for the left front, maximum spring at 500 pounds. Also notice the relationship between the left front spring and the right front spring. We'll talk about that more specifically when we get to the right front, but always notice and keep in mind the relationship of the left front to the right front as that can really help a lot with the rotation of the car. The shocks, I didn't really want to mess with the shocks very much at all, so I left them at default when uh, it was at all possible. But in general, um, two piece of advice I will give you on shocks is if you are not familiar with the shocks and you're not really sure how they work, then of course, play around with them, make adjustments, see how they affect the car on the track. And that's the best way to learn how they behave. But number one, if you're not familiar with the shocks, then let that be the last thing you adjust. Leave them alone on all four corners of the car until you have everything else where you want it, then start adjusting the shocks on one corner of the car, see how it affects the car, and then go back to it. The second thing is don't go too close to the extremes uh, when you're first getting started because the softer the shock number, meaning that if we're talking shock bump, then if I go from seven down to the minimum at three, that's going to make this a, a softer shock. It's going to allow more weight transfer. It's going to be a slower weight transfer. Uh, so it's going to give a very different feel than if I go to the higher number at 16. 16 is going to be a very quick weight transfer. Uh, you're going to feel a much stiffer platform out of the car and quicker response out of the steering wheel. So that is a very different feel from the three minimum to the 16 maximum. So keep that in mind. Uh, you can really change the handling of the car very quickly by adjusting the shocks and that's why I would recommend leaving them to last if you're going to adjust them at all. And again, that's for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with shocks. Now moving on to the tire pressures. Right now you see that both left sides are at 10 pounds, which is the minimum. And then both right sides are at 20 pounds, which is not the minimum for them. But a couple of things to keep in mind with the tire pressure. Number one, this is not proper inflation. Uh, this is the minimums, which means they're going to be underinflated. But the feel that I got from the underinflated tires was the best feel that I had from the tire pressures. And playing around from minimum to maximum tire pressures did not really affect the grip a whole lot one way or another, it was all about a difference in how I wanted the car to feel. The second thing to point out about tire pressures is that you always want to make sure and be cognizant of the difference in tire pressure from the left side to the right side. In this case, we have 10 pounds on the left front and 20 pounds on the right front, so that's a difference of 10 PSI. The bigger the difference in PSI, the bigger the difference between the left side and the right side pressures, the more the car is going to want to turn all on its own. So you're going to introduce more rotation into the car simply because it's essentially adding more stagger in the tires by a little bit. It's not a huge adjustment. It's certainly not akin to what we can do in the right rear that we'll get to in a moment. But it helps the car to rotate a little bit more by making the difference in pressures that much more. And on the flip side of that, by making the difference in left side and right side pressures less, then that's going to tighten the car up. The car's not going to want to rotate quite as much. So that's another way that you can adjust the handling of the car. Now, as we move into the springs, actually, let's go to the right front. Let's just deal with the front tires uh, or front corners of the car, and then we'll get to the rear. On the right front, the camber is at negative 0.5, and as I mentioned with the left front, you can certainly use a wide variety of values here. 
anything from negative 1.0 to negative 0.5, somewhere in that range, is gives me pretty close to uh, the same tire temperatures on the inside and the outside of the tire. The reason I decided to go with that is because it makes the car very sturdy and very predictable in the handling. And that is something that is essential to me if I'm going to be able to have confidence in being able to put the car in the groove I want lap after lap, particularly when I'm fighting for position with several other cars, as tends to happen in this game. The SRX AI are very aggressive, so I need to be able to put the car where I want it to go, and this is very important in doing that. I need the handling to be stable. So if I use, let's say, uh, less camber, so in this case, for the right front, that would be more negative. Okay, if I get up around negative two, negative three, and so on, that's gonna help the right side to get a little bit more grip, particularly on corner entry and through the center. But what I have found is it really didn't help the overall speed of the car. And if I get too much camber, meaning go too far into the negative, it can introduce some instability into the car. So for me, if it's not going to really help the car be faster and give me any uh, better handling characteristics, then I decided to keep it much closer to zero than I might otherwise do. But as I will always say, definitely test this out for yourself and see what works best for you. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about these front springs and how they relate to each other. So once again, 500 pounds max right front spring. If I reduce the right front spring some, then what's going to happen is it's going to help the car to be looser on corner entry and particularly through the center of the corner. It can really help the car to rotate better. And this is even more exaggerated if the left front spring is stronger or uh, stiffer than the right front spring. It can really help the car to rotate, particularly on entry and through the center. However, with this car, with as much speed as we're carrying through the corner, what I found is that the car wanted to roll over on the right front too much. And that's something I can adjust to with my driving style, but I didn't really want to have to adjust to it if it really wasn't helping me. So if you find that the car is too tight on corner entry, and through the center, then maybe drop this by 10 or 20 pounds and see if that helps your corner entry. But again, just be ready for uh, some instability if you go a little bit too far on uh, that adjustment. All right, for once again, the shocks uh, I left alone. Uh, and, and that's going to go for pretty much all my setups in this game. I don't like to mess with the shocks a whole lot because it's very easy to dial a car out. And the overall goal of these setups is to try to help give you guys somewhere to start. And I find that adjusting the shocks can be a very individual uh, performance adjustment, and that is not something I want to do in a video like this. So once again, the tire pressure, 20 versus 10 on the left sides, the more tire pressure that you run will generally uh, take away a little bit of grip, although in this game, I'm not seeing a huge change going from the minimum to the maximum as far as overall grip. It's very much a personal choice as far as the feel that you're looking for. So I highly recommend uh, increasing the tire pressures by 10 or 15 pounds and seeing how uh, the car performs uh, overall for you and see if that's something that you prefer uh, as opposed to more of the minimums that I'm showing you here. Now in the rear of the car, we're gonna look at these uh, together. So you notice in the right rear, we're at 450, left rear, we're at 400. There's a 50 pound rear spring split. That is very important because the bigger the split between the left rear and the right rear spring, the looser the car is gonna be under throttle. So that means whenever in the center of the corner, when you get back to the gas, and in this game, you can get back to it pretty aggressively uh, and pretty quickly, then the car is going to want to rotate all on its own just by getting back to the throttle if you have more rear spring split. So in other words, if let's say you're going through the corner, you get back to the gas and the car wants to jump sideways. It's just too loose once you get back to the gas. Then minimize the amount of split in the rear springs or make the rear springs the same. 450 in the left rear, 450 in the right rear. That will stabilize the car under throttle. Just be aware that that could make the car then too tight and the car won't want to rotate as much uh, or enough 
when you get back to the gas. So play around with the rear spring split and that will give you an idea of how you can adjust that based on your driving style and how you like to use the throttle. If you're very smooth on the throttle and you generally don't use it as an on-off button, uh, then you can get by with more spring split because you can use the gas to rotate the car through the corner rather than stabbing it and going from 100% throttle to zero and back to 100. Again, going to be very much uh, different based on your driving style. Now, once again, uh, the shocks, one thing I did want to make sure of here is that just like we were talking about with the rear springs, I wanted the shock uh, to be the same on both the left rear and the right rear, and that's because I wanted both corners of the car to react the same, particularly when I got back to the throttle. So that's why you see the shock bump at seven on both the left rear and the right rear. Tire pressures we've already talked about, so the remaining item to talk about that we haven't seen so far is tire stagger. Now 1.0 that you see is actually the minimum, and the adjustment goes all the way up to 3.0. I started out at 3.0. The reason I did that is because um, tire stagger in the right rear really helps to rotate the car. It can help you, particularly if you like to drive the car off the right rear and you prefer a looser car, then more tire stagger will definitely give you that. More rotation out of the car and you'll feel the right rear uh, rotating a lot more the more stagger you have. But for me, for consistency, for stability, I actually found that my best laps were run with the minimum tire stagger because for these tracks, we're talking about asphalt and I didn't need the additional rotation. There was already plenty of grip there. So once I got the car balanced uh, with relation to the handling, I didn't need the additional tire stagger. So the more I reduced it, the better the car felt and the more consistent I could be with it. However, if you're finding that the car, no matter what you do to it, is just too tight, it just doesn't rotate enough, and you've determined that you're not overdriving the car, meaning that you're not driving it too deep into the corner, then simply add more tire stagger, and that will definitely help the overall rotation of the car. But just keep in mind, it is going to drastically change the feel of the car. Now let's move on to the front. This is where we get into the front brake bias. Now I'm showing you something very different here than what I'm going to show you in a few moments at Nashville, but 65%. After all the talk of having too much grip in the corner and you can drive it in very uh, deep and you don't really need the brakes to slow down the car, why am I talking about the brake bias? Well, and it's because the brakes are not just for slowing the car down they are a very important handling tool that you can use in the car. Keep in mind, when you're driving the car, there are very few adjustments that you can make that will affect how the car drives, but the brakes are the most important, in my opinion. And this brake bias can help you adjust how the car is driving simply by increasing or decreasing it. So let's talk about what each one does. On the front brake bias, increasing this number, so if I go from 65 to say 70, 75, or so on, when I increase that number, that's gonna make the car tighter whenever I'm applying the brakes. And that's important because let's say that you are too loose on corner entry. The car is just over rotating. You're uh, losing control of the car and of course, scrubbing speed off on corner entry because you're too loose. By using the right amount of front brake bias, uh, say 65, 70, 75%, then you can calm down the car and tighten up the car a little bit by applying just a little bit of brake on corner entry. I like to use the brakes as a timing mechanism. It's more of a rhythm thing for me. Uh, I like to ease off the gas and ease onto the brake just a little bit. You don't need much as far as percentage of brake, but just a little bit will help to calm down the, the front end of the car and also help it to rotate on corner entry, and that can really help improve your lap times. So if the car is too loose on corner entry, then increase the front brake bias and that will allow you to use the brakes to calm down the entry and tighten it up a little bit. On the flip side of that, lowering this number down to 60 or into the 50s and so on, that can really help you to use the brakes as a tool to help the car rotate. Let's say that you're getting into the corner and the car is just too tight. You just can't get the car to rotate exactly the way you need it to. Now, the first thing I would think about is you're overdriving the entry. You're driving it in too deep. 
But if you've determined that that's not it, or if you've just determined that you're going to drive it that way no matter what, and you're looking for a way to help, then lower the front brake bias and drag the brake just a little bit on corner entry. That can help get the car to rotate and can really help the overall feel of the car. And again, I'm going to show you something a little bit different when we get to Nashville, but that is how you can use the brakes to really adjust the handling overall of your car. Then we move on to the weight. How do we adjust the weight in the car? For the front weight, 52.0 worked wonderfully for me at both of these tracks, as you're going to see in a few moments uh, at Nashville. 52.0 is a very good number because the front weight is responsible for the overall rotation of the car. Increasing this number, going up to 52.5, 53.0, and so on, will tighten the car. It, the car will want to rotate less. Decreasing this number to 51.5, 51.0, and so on, will make the car want to rotate more. This is particularly useful when adjusting the entry of the corner. If you're just way too tight on entry, lowering this front weight can help the car to rotate. Increasing it would be is if you're just too loose on corner entry, try increasing the front weight a little bit and that should help calm down the car and tighten it up a little bit on entry. Now the left weight, pretty simple. We're on an oval, we want as much weight to the left of the car as we can get. In this case, that's 54.5%. So on any oval, that's where you're gonna see that maxed out. The corner weight, this is your wedge number. This will dictate how quickly the car wants to rotate. For me, I don't like quick rotations out of the car. I like a quick overall platform in the car, and that's what we talked about with the spring rates, and we'll talk about that in a moment a little bit more with the uh, anti-roll bar. But I don't like the car to uh, rotate too quickly. That's why I'm using a higher number here. 55.0 is the max value. So by lowering this, the car would want to rotate more. This can be particularly helpful in the center of the corner. Uh, if the car is just too tight when you get to the center, then try lowering this number and that'll help the car to rotate a little bit more. For me, I prefer to use other adjustments in the car, such as the rear spring split or maybe even a shock adjustment or track bar, something along those lines. And that will allow me to keep my corner weight or wedge at a much higher value. So let's say that you're already using a much lower number for the wedge or the corner weight. What would increasing that do? Well, increasing this number will slow down the speed of the rotation of the car. That makes the car more stable uh, so that you can be much more deliberate with your uh, steering inputs and know that the car is not going to jump loose whenever you do that. So that's, again, uh, that stability and that precision is why I prefer a higher corner weight and simply use the rest of the car to adjust uh, the balance as I need. Now the anti-roll bar or the anti-sway bar in the front one and a half inches worked very well for me. The higher number you use here, that's going to make the car stiffer and tighter overall in the front end. So again, if you're too loose on corner entry and you just can't get the car uh, to behave and tighten up as you need it to, then try going up a click or two on the anti-roll bar. That should tighten up your car, particularly on entry and through the center. But for me, one and a half worked very well. Um, I have used down to 1.315 and that also works very well. Just keep in mind, it's going to adjust the feel of the car. As I reduce this number, as I go lower on the anti-roll bar, uh, the front anti-roll bar, then it's going to make the car a little bit looser overall. However, for me, the feel gets a little bit unstable the lower I get, uh, particularly once I go below the setting you're looking at now, the 1.3. The car starts to feel a little bit unstable, particularly on corner entry, so that's why the 1.5 has worked well for me. But again, lower numbers are generally going to help the car rotate more. Higher numbers here are going to tighten the car. Then we get to the ride height. And you see I'm at negative 2.0, that's the minimum. And I want the ride height as, I want the front end as low as I can get it. And that means the minimum ride height here. Now at every track, you might not necessarily be able to use the minimum of negative 2.0. If you get it too low, the front end could hit the track and that's gonna cause you all sorts of trouble. Uh, you don't want that. But I want the car to get as low as I can in the front end. That gives me more front grip. So the lower the number here, the more front grip I get, the higher the number. So as I 
make this number less negative or more positive, then the tighter the car is going to be. The front end just won't have as much grip. So for me, I'm going to try to use the absolute minimum front ride height that I can get in order to get all of the front grip that I can. In the rear of the car, let's begin actually with the ride height. So we talked about how maximum grip for the front is with the minimum. Well, in relation to that, I found that with the ride height in the rear, the lower the number, meaning the more negative I make this number, the looser the car gets. And there's a couple of possibilities, without knowing the specifics about the physics, there's a couple of possibilities for why this could be, but for our purposes today, that's not really relevant. The key is, the lower this number is, the looser the car gets. The more I go back toward zero or even into the positive uh, area, the tighter the car will get. So always keep in mind the relation of the front ride height to the rear ride height. And, and uh, the lower you can get the front end in relation to the, to the rear of the car, the tighter the car will be overall. But again, uh, this is a great way to adjust the car with just the ride height. If I come into this ride height and I lower it down, I'm going to expect the car to be looser overall, particularly on corner exit. But the more I raise this number or get it closer to a positive value, the tighter overall the car is going to be. So keep that in mind. Uh, it is a great adjustment to use, especially when you're getting very close to where the, the handling you want from the car and you're just looking to make those last fine-tune adjustments. Moving on now to the miscellaneous section. Uh, wheel lock is at 30 degrees. Now, for those of you who have been with the channel for a while and see me go through the NASCAR heat series and so on, you'll know that wheel lock at 30 degrees is actually very high for me. Not something that I normally used. However, by default, the game had it up very high and I decided to try it out. And so what you see in the setup is something that works very well with the higher wheel lock. In general, with the wheel lock, the higher numbers you use, the more responsive the car will be, the more twitchy the car will be. However, if you lower those numbers, uh, and my traditional range would have been somewhere between 10 and about 15, that is going to give you finer control over the car. You're going to get um, the ability to turn the wheel more before the car reacts, so slower reactions from the wheel. This is very much a matter of personal preference. Then we get into the steering offset. I'm not using any uh, right now for these cars, and that's because this is tied very closely to the camber that you have in the car. And the idea behind the steering offset is if you're having to, on the straightaways, turn the wheel to the right to keep the car going straight on the, on the straightaway, then you can use some steering offset so that unsurprisingly you offset that turn to the right and so you can just steer straight on the straightaway but the more camber you're using and the front tires the more this will come into play but for me I'm not using a whole lot of front camber so I really didn't notice any reason uh, to get into the steering offset but again if you decide that you want to use a lot more camber then you might need to increase this steering offset some just be careful about going too far because if you go too far, you'll actually introduce a pull to the right on the straightaway, which will probably be very disconcerting and not something that you want. Now, as far as the tire compound, I did play around just a little. didn't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, trying out particularly the soft versus the firm tire. And to this point, I haven't figured out any reason to use anything other than the soft. There is a difference that I felt in the tire. In fact, the firm tire was a little bit slower for me, but theoretically, the idea would be that the softer tire would give you more grip and more speed in the early part of a run for the first several laps, but then the firm tire or the medium tire would give you less grip on the front end, so less overall speed, but the tire grip wouldn't fall off as much on a long run. Now, I haven't run a full race weekend at 100% in the SRX cars, but I have run about 30 minutes. Uh, in a race, and I didn't notice very much fall off at all in the tires. The tires were definitely wearing uh, for the soft tire, but I didn't notice a lot of fall off, so there's really no reason that I saw to get off the soft tire. But who knows? Maybe if you're running 100% races, uh, keep in mind that the SRX series, my experience so far has been it uses the same tire 
from the first heat race to the second heat race and then into the main event. So keep in mind, you're going to be on the same tire for the entirety of the race weekend. So who knows? Maybe somewhere along the way, we notice a reason to change from the soft tire. But as of yet, I have not seen it. Then into uh, the gearing. And for our purposes here, I'm going to stick with the fourth gear ratio as well as the final drive or the rear end ratio that it lists. And that's because these two are very much linked once we're in fourth gear. And of course, at most every track, fourth gear is what you're going to use as your racing gear, except for maybe Slinger. Uh, since it is such a very short track with a lot of banking, who knows, you might want to use third there. But for the most part, fourth is what we're after. So it's the combination of these two that are going to give you your overall uh, fourth gear and final drive. So what you need to know about these is that the higher the number you use, so if I go from 5.0 up to 5.1, 5.2, and so on, that's going to give me more RPMs. So higher numbers, higher RPMs. Lower numbers, if I go from 5.0 to 4.9, 4.8, and so on, lower numbers, lower RPMs. So what most people like to do here is you want the car to hit the rev limiter to where you cannot go any faster, you can't get any more RPMs out of the engine right at the very end of the straightaway just as you're about to lift off the gas for corner entry. I generally prefer to back off of that just a little bit because I don't like being on the rev limiter very much. However, everybody's style is a little bit different and who knows, you might find that increasing or decreasing your RPMs might give you a little bit more speed. Uh, so definitely something to test out. But for me, I prefer to stay off the rev limiter whenever possible because if anything, it's just another distraction that uh, I have to deal with that I would prefer not to. And in my case, I haven't noticed any difference in speed from backing off the rev limiter a little bit. So keep that in mind. Also, realize that the speed you are going on the track will determine what your fourth gear or rear end ratio will need to be. So when we talked about lap times uh, a little bit earlier, if you're running faster lap times than me, then you're going to be turning more RPMs than me. So you might need to adjust this and maybe reduce this a click or two to back off the RPMs a little bit to give yourself a little bit more top end speed. However, if you're running slower speed, slower lap times than what I'm running, then you might need to go up a click or two to give yourself a little bit more RPM. One final thing to keep in mind uh, before we head over to Nashville and take a look at that setup briefly is that whenever you're adjusting the rear end ratio, more RPMs are going to generally make the car looser. You've got more torque coming from the rear tires. Generally, it's going to make the car a little bit looser. Less RPM is generally going to tighten the car up a little bit. So as well as adjusting your overall RPM with the rear end ratio, you can also adjust the handling of the car. We're not going to spend a great deal of time on the Nashville setup uh, simply because we've already covered all that with the Stafford setup and all of the adjustments still apply at this track just as they did with Stafford. So let's talk very briefly about lap times and a little bit about my approach to the track. 16.30, again, that's maximum uh, AI difficulty and I cannot touch that. My quickest laps are in the 16.6 range. So 16.6, 16.65, somewhere in that range for my quickest laps. So keep that in mind. Again, uh, when you're thinking about adjustments to the car, you may be faster or slower than those times. As far as the track itself, um, one thing is make sure you get to the bottom, just like we talked about with Stafford. Get to that white line around the bottom. There is some room just below it so that you can go slightly below that white line and still be okay. But if you get much below that, you get down on the, uh, the flat part on the apron and that can mess up your handling and of course is gonna cost you uh, lap time ultimately. The second thing is at Nashville, there is a very nice guide that is very useful when you are learning the track. Um, as we talk about the entry of the corner and backing up the entry, Nashville gives you a great guideline. As you're approaching corner entry, you'll notice the hash marks the dotted lines that will start to appear for the upper groove. Well, a great way to learn the track and to learn your entry point is to begin by lifting just as you get to the hash marks. 
and then adjust that. Maybe try it after a little while, you've gotten used to the track, drive it in a little bit deeper than that, and then a little bit deeper than that, and then ultimately you can figure out where you need to lift, but I find that those hash marks or the dotted lines uh, for the upper groove that start right as you get to corner entry can be a excellent guide in helping you with uh, your entry point. Now let's hop very quickly into the setup. So as we get in here, you're gonna see a lot of things that look very similar or the same as what we dealt with with Stafford. One thing very quickly that I will point out is the camber here you notice is at zero. Doesn't mean that's the only thing that works, but for me, that worked really well for this track, but negative 0.5 or negative one also worked very well. Another thing I want to point out is that front brake bias. So we were at 65% at Stafford, 50% here at Nashville. Now I did that not because one works better than the other at a certain track, but because I wanted to very specifically show you something very different because at Nashville, what I found is that the SRX cars are extremely aggressive and a lot of times I'm gonna to need to drive it deep into the corner in order to maintain position below them. Because what I find that they are doing to me is if I run my normal line backing off the gas earlier, then any car that might have been on the outside lane will try to jump down to the bottom in front of me and that can cause a wreck or at the very least mess up my corner. So I need to drive it in deeper to maintain my position. And one way that I can do that without ruining the handling of the car is to lower that front brake bias to 50, 55%, something like that. And then on entry, drive it in deeper, but then drag the brake a little bit on entry. That's gonna help keep the car rotating so that I can maintain that bottom groove without sliding up into uh, the car on the outside. Because normally, if I drive it in that deep, the car might slide up in the center of the corner, then we make contact, somebody might get underneath me, whole lot of problems can present themselves there. So by lowering the front brake bias and dragging the brake a little bit on entry, that can really help me to maintain my position and maintain the groove that I wanna be in, which is right on the bottom. So just a couple of different ways of doing that. And like I said, this same thing will work at Stafford just like it works at Nashville or really any other track uh, once you think about it, particularly the asphalt tracks, since the dirt tracks are gonna be a totally different animal. Other than that, most everything is either the same or very similar. Uh, you will notice the track bar a little bit higher here at Nashville, as that tends to uh, make the car rotate better from the center of the corner off. I needed a little bit more rotation there at Nashville because it is, again, so fast that keeping this car rotating helped me maintain more speed through the corners. And then, of course, your gearing is going to be a little bit different because different lengths of track, different banking, and so on. Uh, all that leads to different speeds and ultimately uh, different ratios in the rear end. But as I said at the very beginning, the goal of these setup videos is not to give you some wonderful setup that I think is perfect or magical. It's to give you something to start with and most importantly, give you the information so that you can adjust it and maximize the amount of enjoyment you're having from today's game. And hopefully that's what today's video has done. So thank you guys so much for joining me and stick around as we will continue our support for SRX, the game.